There's a question that the Buddha recommends we ask ourselves every day. It goes like this. Days and nights fly past, fly past. What am I doing right now? And John Fuhr once asked me, suppose the Buddha was right here right now asking you that question, how would you answer? What kind of answer would you not feel embarrassed to tell the Buddha? Okay, then just do that. If you're telling him that you're trying to comprehend suffering, trying to let go of the cause, develop the path so you can realize the end of suffering, that's an answer you wouldn't be ashamed to give him. So let's spend the next hour doing one of those four, whichever one seems appropriate for you right now. Notice that all these questions and all the answers have to do with doing. What are you doing right now? The Four Noble Truths don't just sit there. They have tasks that follow in line with them. You see again and again and again, this is the emphasis of the Buddhist teachings, actions and their results. Which actions are worthwhile, i.e. skillful, and which ones are not. That's the basic dividing line in his teaching. And there's, notice there's no question there of what you are. What are you truly? What is your true identity? As he said, any attempts to answer that question, on the one hand, entangle you in a thicket of views, which simply keep you entangled and you can't get anywhere. On the other hand, he said, however you identify yourself, you're limiting yourself in terms of your gender, your race, your occupation. whatever the identification. It's a limitation. So we're not here to define ourselves, to find out what we truly are, who we really are. We're trying to find out what are you doing that's causing suffering? What can you do to not cause suffering? Now you realize that you'll have a strong sense of who you are around those activities. The Buddha said, Part of comprehending suffering is to see that we cling to these five aggregates of form, feeling, perception, fabrication, consciousness. And each of the aggregates is defined by a verb. It's an activity. We build a sense of who you, we are around the activities. And that gets in the way of seeing which activities are skillful, which ones are not. You have a strong sense of identifying with something, and then you, either you like the identity or you don't like the identity, or you run up against resistance from other people, which makes you cling even more strongly to that identity. And it gets in the way of really seeing what you're doing, what's skillful and what's not, and what if you see that it's unskillful, what you can do to change. I don't know how many times I've been asked the question about well, the Buddha says we have Buddha nature, then why do people behave the way they do? Well, let's go back to the assumption. The Buddha never talks about Buddha nature. If anyone would have the right to talk about Buddha nature, he'd be the one, but he doesn't. He doesn't assume that we're good, doesn't assume that we're bad. If you start with the assumption that you're basically good deep down inside, then all the problems in your life are things that are imposed on you by society. Then you're quest for the end of suffering means learning how to resist society. Or if you feel that you're basically bad inside, okay, then you need somebody else to come down and help you. In other words, both assumptions get in the way. The Buddha's only assumption is that we want happiness. If you don't want happiness, you're not ready for his teaching. But I don't know anybody who 
would not want happiness. He simply asks you to take that desire seriously, responsibly. Look at your habits. Which of your habits are helpful, which ones are not? And what can you change if they're not help helpful? Which ones can be changed quickly? Which ones are going to take time? The ones that take time, that's where the issue of patience and equanimity comes in. Patience, equanimity, acceptance, these are not the goal of the path. They're qualities you want to learn how to develop. They're also habits you want to learn how to develop in cases where the changes take time. You've got a mind that refuses to settle down. Well, that's something that's just going to take time. doesn't mean it will never settle down or that your nature is unsettled, that you can never do it. It simply means you've got a lot of habits to work through. That's where patience and equanimity are important, because it means you have a long-term goal. And in our society, encourages people to want quick results. And so very often we don't have any experience with long-term goals. And how to relate to them in a mature way. This is why patience and equanimity are so important, because they are essential to be on a path, realizing that you're not there at the end yet, but you're taking steps in the right direction. And you may take a few missteps, but that's how you learn. This is what equanimity is all about, is learning how to admit your mistakes, and then pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and keep on going, realizing that you can't go back and undo a past mistake. but. You do have the opportunity to make the resolve that you're not going to repeat it. But equanimity and patience require understanding of how you're going to go about this. Because otherwise, you, you're sitting there with yourself and you're being taught to accept yourself, which is a good thing in this in a step, but you're not, you're not being asked to just stay there stuck. If it's unhappy, if it's miserable, there are ways out. This is another place where the idea that you're, you're not stuck with a permanent identity, either good or bad. You simply got that desire for happiness. The teachings are here to bring wisdom to that desire. Independent core rising, the Buddha starts out with ignorance. Ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. These tasks that the Buddha sets out with the Four Noble Truths. And when you're ignorant of those tasks, then you start doing other things. From With ignorance as a condition, there are fabrications, i.e. what you think you are is something you've fabricated. Sometimes you're doing the fabrication right here and now. Sometimes it's the results of past fabrications, but it's all fabricated. It's all put together, which means it can be taken apart and put together in other ways. The basic elements are five. They're divided into three kinds of fabrication. The first one is physical fabrication, which is the breath. If you breathe in ignorance, it's going to be a contribute to your suffering. This is one of the reasons why the meditation technique that the Buddha taught most frequently was breath meditation. Bring some awareness to the breath, and particularly bring awareness to whether the breath is comfortable or not, whether it's a cause of suffering or it's a part of the path that leads to right concentration, a sense of ease, a sense of fullness or rapture or refreshment. That ties into the next level of fabrication, which is verbal fabrication. There are two kinds. There's directed thought and there's evaluation. Directed thought is when you focus your attention on a particular topic to keep it there. And then evaluation is checking to see, does, how does this feel? Does this feel 
good? Does this feel right? Is this a comfortable place to stay? Is it an uncomfortable place to stay? How about my mind? Is it ready to settle down right now, or does it need a few other reflections before it's willing to settle down in the present moment? Settle down with the breath. If your mind refuses to settle down, analyze it. What direction is it going in? Is it too much energy, too little energy? Is the energy heading off into that side of irritation or desire? Are there reflections that can help you with that? But notice that once you get the mind ready to settle down, okay, come back to the breath. So you put the direct thought and the evaluation together with the breath. And the third level of fabrication, mental fabrication, that has two elements as well. There's feeling and there's perception. And once you're directing your thoughts to the breath, evaluating it, then the question of how you perceive the breath and how you the feelings that arise as a result. These are important things to look into. How do you conceive the process of breathing? What is this breath energy in the body? What kind of mental picture do you have of the breath? Does the mental picture help make the breath a more pleasant place to stay or an unpleasant place to stay? And the way to test that, of course, is to change your perceptions. This is why John Lee talks about so many different ways of conceiving breath energy in the body. You try them on and see what seems to work best, and you'll find that Different conceptions or different perceptions will work best at different times. So it's good to have a whole range of those perception available. So what you've got here, all the elements of fabrication are all brought together in one place. Then as you work with them around the breath, you find that you get more and more skilled at identifying them and learning to work through the difficult ones. Not so you do this only while you're working on the breath, but you begin to learn how to deal with other issues that come up and learn how to break them down into those same elements. You'll find that your thoughts, as they come through the body, will be associated with a particular kind of breath and directed thought and evaluation and feelings and perceptions. Your emotions will as well. When a strong feeling comes in, okay, how are you breathing? Exactly. What are you thinking about? How are you evaluating the situation? What are the perceptions that underlie it? If you can recognize that the emotion or the thought is something unskillful, how do you change those different elements? This is how you deconstruct a fabrication. And this is important. When an emotion comes up, often we're just blown away by it. And in particular, we tend to identify with it strongly. The idea of not identifying with emotion, for a lot of people, almost becomes a political issue. You feel like you're being told by somebody else that you can't have this emotion, you can't be your true self. But again, if you try to look at your true self, all you find are fabrications. So why would you want to do something? Why would you want to identify with something that's unskillful? This is not that anybody else is forcing you not to identify with it. Simply look at it, look at it for yourself and see. Does this help bring about true happiness? If not, learn how to look at it. Take it apart in its various parts. This is where equanimity and patience come into you. Step back and see, what am I doing here that's causing suffering? What can I change? So in this way, you come to realize that whatever comes up in the mind, it's not that you're den denying that it's there. You simply ask the question, is this really skillful? The Buddha once said that it was how he got on the path to begin with. Just dividing his thoughts and his emotions into two kinds, those that led to 
self-harm or harm of others, and those who led to, that didn't lead to harm at all. And they learned how to check, as he said, check and curb the unskillful ones. That wasn't just forcing them down, it meant taking them apart, and then taking those elements and putting them together in a new way. So you learn how to look at things in a new way, have new perspectives, new perceptions, new feelings. These are part of your repertoire. You're not limited to what you've been identifying with all along, good or bad. You've got a wider range, a wider range of tools for finding true happiness. Some people don't like the idea of not-self, and you dig down in a little bit into their reasons why, and finally it comes down to the question, well, how could you function? In other words, it sounds like you're being deprived of some very basic tools. The not-self teaching is giving you a wider range of tools than you'd have by holding to a specific way of identifying yourself. When I first went to stay with the John Fugang, there was one night I had a dream. I was in a John Fugang's closet, and he had lots and lots of different kinds of hats. some Thai hats, some American hats, all kinds of hats in his closet. And as I got to know him, I realized he did wear lots of different hats, take on different roles, different identities, as they're appropriate to the occasion. Sometimes you hear people talking about famous teachers, and you, you're around them, and it seems like there's nobody there. Well, it's not that there's nobody there. It's simply that he's looking at the situation not in terms of who he is, but in terms of what's needed to be done, and then just do what needs to be done, which can often be surprising, out of character. But if it's appropriate, if it's skillful, if it really does help lead to less harm, then why should your character or personality be allowed to get in the way? So learn to be a person of many hats. There was a Zen teacher who once identified Buddha nature as change. It was even better not to have an idea about Buddha nature or whatever, just, okay, there is a possibility of change. You don't have to have a particular nature at all. All you're asked to is to really sincerely take your desire for happiness seriously. Do it wisely, with compassion, and with purity. And you find that it really can reach to a true happiness, a happiness that's not affected by conditions, that's not fabricated. It's not limited by anything at all. So don't let your idea of who you are, either bad or good or whatever, limit you. If you think you're good, then there's that whole question, or good by nature. And you start believing, well, when the mind is quiet, its natural wisdom will come up and you can trust it. That kind of teaching teaches people to be complacent in the practice. That gets in the way. If you think you're bad by nature, you can't trust anything that you've got. You've only got to do what you're told by other people or hope that other people will do the work for you. That gets in the way as well. So don't be either good or bad. Just really, sincerely desire true happiness. And just looking at things in those terms, that liberates you in a lot of ways already right there.